an asteroid is a bit of a planetesimal, an early planet that broke up through collisions, or it could be a body that never formed a planet and includes the elements silicon, magnesium, calcium, aluminum, iron, in the same proportions that we observe in the sun. So these are leftovers of solar system formation. There are a lot of terms in that involve the word meteor. Meteorites are rocks from space that have hit the ground and we have recovered. We recover them mostly in deserts, hot deserts like the Sahara Desert or cold deserts like Antarctica. If we observe something flying through the sky, it might be a meteor shower, little tiny things the size of a grain of sand or a grain of rice that are leftovers of comets and so forth that we have plowed through as if we're a car on a highway and they're like bugs on our windshield. There are also a class of objects called meteoroids and a good example is one that flew over the Tetons and was actually filmed in 1972. It was an object that came through the atmosphere, made a trail, people saw it, and then flew right out. So it sort of skipped off the atmosphere. And we call that a meteoroid. It's not a meteorite, it's not a meteor, so it must be a meteoroid. The structure of the solar system is interesting. We have the innermost planets, the four that are rocky planets. Mars is a very small planet, relatively speaking. Why is it so small? That's a big question in planetary science. Then Jupiter, big, gas giant. Jupiter and Saturn accreted so much that they got really big. And then you have the ice giants, Neptune, Uranus. And then you have the Kuiper belt with Pluto and other planetary bodies in it that is mostly ice balls, which we've only begun to explore. The asteroid belt between Jupiter and Mars is the source of many of our meteorites. It has a relatively small mass, only about 4% of the mass of the Moon. Most of that mass is in the largest asteroids, and most of the asteroids are relatively small. And there are a couple of theories of why no planets formed in the asteroid belt early on in the solar system's history. One is that Jupiter drifted inward toward Mars and hurled the bodies in the asteroid belt either into the inner planet region or out towards the Kuiper belt. That left the planetesimals there with too much energy to form a planet. Another theory is that Uranus and Neptune switched places early on in the formation of the solar system. That action would have scattered the bodies in the Kuiper belt, shooting a battery of rocks and icy planetesimals into the inner solar system and the outer solar system. There are many ideas about how our solar system reached the stable configuration of planets that we see today. Those ideas have to explain the asteroid belt and the icy bodies beyond Neptune. The origin of our solar system is a fascinating and very difficult cosmochemical and astrophysical problem. supports this theory that the Earth's moon formed in a large collision, probably only one collision, between the Earth and a Mars-sized object very early, within 60 million years of the Earth really accreting and differentiating into a core and a mantle. That's a big event in Earth history. We know from Mercury, from the moon, that there were many large impacts in the early solar system. When you look at the moon, and you see these big dark patches that are roundish. Those are impact basins, huge impact basins that are filled with lava from inside the moon. So we can use the moon as a measuring rod for the impact history of the Earth and all of the inner planets. And of course, we're familiar with the asteroid that hit the Earth 65 million years ago, causing a huge crater in the Caribbean. Evidence from this impact has been found around the world as a thin sedimentary layer called the Cretaceous-Paleogene Boundary, or KPG for short. 
Geologists discovered that this layer is rich in metallic elements like iridium that are rare on the crust and mantle of the Earth because they've been concentrated in the core, but they're common in asteroids and comets because those bodies haven't formed a core. The reason the geologists made that distinction between the Cretaceous period and the Paleogene is this huge change in the nature of life itself, where mammals take over and most of the dinosaurs disappear. The ammonites in the ocean are gone, but more importantly at the plankton level, the, the small, small creatures, the small life forms, which make very nice sediments that are datable, it's like a knife edge in the record of life itself. As a result of a cosmic collision, an accident really, something that happens every so often and we hope doesn't happen to us. This does not happen very often. There are lots of ideas about how to deflect an asteroid. One is you put something massive near it, which then gravitationally tugs it into a different orbit. One other idea is if it's not tumbling in its orbit around the sun, you can paint actually part of the asteroid with something very reflective. And that actually would allow sunlight itself to push the asteroid into a different orbit. Another idea is simply blow something up into smaller pieces, hoping that those smaller pieces, when they hit the atmosphere, will each break up into small pieces as if they were meteor shower. Deflecting something so it lands in the ocean might sound like a good idea, but then you get waves. So it depends where in the ocean you're talking about. And so there are lots of ideas and there are lots of caveats to each of those ideas, but I think that as humans, we have the technology to do this kind of thing. We have to think as global citizens in responding to these kinds of threats. We have evidence of lots of impacts on the Earth. In the United States and Arizona, we have the best preserved impact crater on the surface of the Earth. It's called Meteor Crater. Uh, it should be meteorite crater, shouldn't it? Because we have pieces of the actual iron rock that made that crater that came off before the actual cratering event. That is about a kilometer in diameter. It's a tiny crater. On the moon, you wouldn't even notice it. But it happened 50,000 years ago. So that gives you an idea of how often big things like that actually happen on the Earth. A thing moving faster than the speed of sound, much faster than the speed of sound, will actually build up air pressure in front of it, it's called ram pressure, and will essentially explode. This happens way up in the atmosphere, 30 to 50 kilometers, depending on how fast an object is going and what angle it comes in at. And so once these pieces of an object continue to come to Earth, they will spread out and slow down and eventually fall more or less in free fall to the Earth. The U.S. Congress has mandated that NASA, through its observatories, in conjunction with the amateur community, identify and find all of the near-Earth objects that are larger in size than 140 meters, which is about a football field if you count the end zones, and a little bit of the sidelines. Not because they're going to destroy civilization, but because they could do a lot of damage. Look what happened with Chelyabinsk, and it was only about 20 meters in diameter. From 30 kilometers up, it was breaking windows, big windows. 
with a good modern telescope in a dark sky environment, you can see a lot of things. And if you have a camera and you have software that can see things moving against the fixed stars, you can find asteroids, you can find comets. And so this is something that has ballooned in the last 20 years. And there's been a tremendous rise in the number of objects that we've found and then of course track. And if you go on to the Minor Planets Center website, which is maintained by NASA, that will tell you what's out there today, what we've seen lately. It's really interesting to look at the historical rise, exponential rise in the number of objects that we know about in the sky that are potential Earth crossers. The Earth is going around the sun at about 30 kilometers per second. We're all moving really fast. And just like a windshield of a car hitting bugs, we hit rocks, space rocks. Many of these are leftovers from comets dropping little breadcrumbs behind them. And these paths, as we cross them, make meteor showers. Meteorites are bigger rocks. They come in through the atmosphere. They're going very, very fast. And if they come to the Earth and they hit the Earth and we pick them up as a rock, then they're a meteorite. What do meteorites tell us? They tell us about the formation of the solar system. They tell us about planets, our only samples of other planets are meteorites. And they tell us about the dynamic history of the solar system through the craters left by impacting meteorites. Through the samples in the hall, we tell the stories about these topics. For example, if you look at the section on the origin of the solar system, the Allende meteorite that was observed to fall in Mexico in 1969 turned out to be a very important rock because it contains calcium aluminum rich inclusions and they're big enough that we could do isotopic dating and come up with an age of the oldest rocks formed in the solar system, which is 4,567.8 thousand million years. So four and a half billion, roughly. When planets grow big enough to melt, they differentiate into a core and a mantle, like the Earth. But we haven't actually seen the deep interior of the Earth. We can't drill down to the core of the Earth. So we infer the Earth's core by looking at the density of the Earth itself. We know there must be a very dense core. The study of meteorites fits in there because early, very early in the solar system, little planetary bodies formed cores and in our planetary section of the hall, pieces of those kinds of bodies, early planets, are recorded in the iron meteorites. And so studying those rocks gives us evidence for what is actually deep in the Earth that we can't sample in any other way. Asteroids are in the asteroid belt between roughly Mars and Jupiter, but there are lots of asteroids that cross the Earth's orbit, and those are called near-Earth asteroids. And one of the topics we explore in the hall is, in fact, the hazards that meteorites pose. If we have big objects hit the Earth, large enough to make craters, then we start to think about hazards. If it lands in the ocean, it makes big waves. If it lands on land, it throws up a lot of dust. The sun good. There are a lot of people thinking about stopping asteroids from hitting the Earth. But it's a tricky business. And knowing about the asteroids proves critical. So, for example, if an asteroid reflects a lot of sunlight, then the sunlight is bouncing off of it, giving it energy and pushing it in one direction. And so, when you talk about deflecting asteroids, one way to do it might be to paint the asteroid with something reflective so that the sun pushes on it harder. And if you do that early enough, then you can deflect the rock. 
So the way that the rocks interact with light, which goes by the term spectroscopy, is really important. Spectroscopy also gives you clues to the minerals that are present on the surface of whatever rock you're looking at. For example, because we were in orbit around the asteroid Vesta for two years, we have close-up spectroscopy. We know how those rocks on Vesta reflect sunlight in different wavelengths. And we can look at the meteorites in the case about Vesta, and they have the same spectrum. So we can match Vesta to these rocks. And one of the future important aspects of meteorite science is in fact connecting specific meteorites to specific asteroids. Meteorites are samples sent to us by processes in the solar system over which we have no control. Sample return, we control. And liftoff of OSIRIS-REx, its seven-year mission to boldly go to the asteroid venue and back. Sample return missions are really difficult. They require a spacecraft to rendezvous with a target collect material from the surface of the target, and bring it back to Earth. So one of the things that we're going for with sample return is that material that hasn't been through that very brutal process of entering the Earth's atmosphere at high speed. So when we return samples from a comet, samples of the solar wind, samples from the darkest asteroids which have the most carbon near the surface which is going to tell us about origin of life type chemistry these are the important things and the important targets for research so if this thing formed in space then why does the sulfur exist here the american museum of natural history is about science it's about communicating science but it's also about doing science and we have a great meteorite collection that we study to understand what these rocks can tell us. My research is focused on a group of meteorites called the ordinary chondrites. Meteorites that are very primitive and their component parts are unaltered since they formed in the early solar system. When you're cutting a meteorite, you always want to make sure that you're minimizing loss of the sample. And so everything we do in the cutting process and in the preparation process is to avoid that. My research focuses on the spectral properties of meteorites. If we can match the spectral properties of the meteorites we have here with the spectral features of asteroids in the asteroid belt, then we can determine the parent bodies that these meteorites came from. I'm studying samples of comet dust collected by the NASA Stardust mission and returned to Earth in 2006. Comets are some of the most primitive remnants left over from the early stages of solar system formation. They can give us clues to the environmental conditions at the time and also help to answer some of those existential questions like, how did the sun and the planets come to be? How did we get here? In the museum, you can find meteorites, not just in this hall, but in the hall of planet Earth and in the hall of the universe, because meteorites give us clues to the formation of the Earth, the deep interior of the Earth, and also to the larger galaxy of which this solar system is a part.